So yesterday I uh, got to go quadding out in the back country, which was really good, out behind Dave and Grace's house. And uh, it was such a beautiful drive, or quad, or whatever you want to, it is a drive. It was so beautiful, and I just kept thinking that, man, it's so beautiful here, it's so beautiful out here. And it took me a long, long time, like maybe over an hour and a half before I finally realized, you know, this is God's glory, this is God's beauty, God created all this, this is beautiful because of God, and it just, it hit me that it took me so long to glorify God for what he had done. It wasn't too long ago that we finally got to use the backyard for something for the first time in my four years here. We did plan to have a barbecue back in, back in the backyard in, in 2019 that ended up getting rained out and moved indoors, but I was really hoping that this time that wouldn't happen again. And even the night before, it showed that there was going to be straight rain all morning and afternoon, right? It was going to be a rainy day that day. Now, this isn't the biggest deal in the world, right? It would just have been another failed barbecue, but I still prayed a lot for it anyway, for the weather to change. Sunday morning came around, and though it wasn't raining, the clouds still looked ready to start pouring. My barbecue, though, was here, and uh, the burgers were all here, and people had already made sides to bring, and then when I was practicing my preaching in the morning before the service, it did start to rain. It started really raining. So I kept praying. And when the, servant start, when the service started, it wasn't raining anymore. But of course, you know, anything can change. But after the service, it looked promising enough that, that we did decide to eat out there. And the rain held up. There was only a few minutes of spray that came down while we were already eating our dessert after the meal. And even after that spray, that's when it really, really got sunny and nice and warm. Now, as amazing as I thought that answer to prayer was, I actually forgot to personally thank the Lord for answering my prayer until way later that day. The Bible tells us, in everything, give thanks. And yet here was this big deal. God had changed the weather, and I was slow to thank him. Now, God's answered, you know, many prayers in my life. He's been there in big situations and also in the little, little things like just having this barbecue. That have it go well and be able to actually use the backyard. He's answered many prayers and I do thank him a lot of the time, but I just wonder how often I've forgotten or have been slow to thank him that I might have just not even realized. Now, we do learn from our mistakes, and my hope is just that we notice when we forget to thank God so that we actually realize our mistake. Now, when we think of David here, who knows how often David thanked the Lord, but we also do have many examples in the Psalms showing us that he absolutely did thank the Lord. I don't know how often, but he definitely did. So I hope that in reading his words here in 2 Samuel 22, we can be reminded to give credit where credit is due. Give God the glory to, to thank him for what he does in every situation of our lives. So with that said, let's read 2 Samuel 22. And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge. My Savior, you saved me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. For the waves of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the cords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled 
and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness Around him, his canopy, thick clouds, a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make, yourself, you make yourself seem tortuous. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop. And by my God, I can help, or I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He has made my feet like the deer, the feet of a deer, and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me, you have given me the shield of your salvation and your gentleness made me great. You gave a, a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them, I thrust them through so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, those who had hated me, and I destroyed them. They looked, but there was none to save. They cried out to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as the dust of the earth. I crushed them and stamped them down like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with my people. You kept me as the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. Foreigners came cringing to me as soon as they heard of me. They obeyed me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives and blessed be my rock. And exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me, who brought me out, of, who brought me out from my enemies. You exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from men of violence. For this, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. And sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king. And shows steadfast love to his anointed. To David and his offspring forever. God, you are amazing and wonderful. And I just hope that this translates to show so much of your glory. So much of who you are and why you deserve to be praised and honored and thanked. And so I pray that you would be with me as I preach that if I say anything that's wrong or untrue, uh, that it would not be believed in the name of Jesus, that you would hide that. But Lord, for your sake, I pray that your truths 
would be remembered, that they would be taken to heart, that you would give everyone here understanding of your truths, and that you would be at work in all of our hearts, God, so that you might be glorified. Be glorified in the name of Jesus. I pray this all in your mighty name, Lord. Amen. Again, we have taken a step out of the chronological timeline of the events of 2 Samuel, and now we focus on David's song of deliverance. It seems to me that when it's introduced, that it could be that this was something that he said on maybe many occasions, uh, because we get this very vague description of when he said this in verse 1. And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And so there's multiple, multiple different occasions when this could have happened. Many times he was delivered from his enemies and many times he was delivered from one enemy in particular, King Saul. So it's possible that this was a psalm that he recited often. And also just knowing that he was a musical guy and it's possible that this had maybe a a certain tune to it that made it more memorable. And of course, he wrote the words down. Of course, he wrote the words down because we have them here. And also in Psalm 18 with a tiny bit of variation. So it's possible that this was recited. Uh, But whether it was something that was often recited or not... We know who is being talked about here, who is being brought up, and that is his enemies, including, of course, King Saul, as it says. Now, this is all spoken, though, as it says, to God. So this is not just a song or a psalm. It's a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of praise. Even though the words aren't always directed as if he's talking to God, you know, because he mostly speaks of God in the third person until about verse 26, and even after that, he's not done with the third person. The entire thing is still directed to God. This is who he's talking to. Even though he says, the Lord has done this, and he did that, and it sounds like it's directed at first at at the people or some people that he might be talking to about how amazing God is. And maybe that was partially the original intent. But the main intent is, is that it's all spoken, perhaps recited, to God. Give God the glory. Give God the praise to his face personally. Which, of course, you know, of course he hears everything anyway. But this is specifically driving at that personal connection, right? You are in relationship with God. You don't want to just talk by him. You want to talk to him. Now, why give God the glory? Well, for David, he gets very specific, right? The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my refuge, my savior. You save me from my enemies. The Lord's walls cannot be breached. The enemy can't break break through him. So he, to David, is a refuge, is a fortress, keeping the enemy from breaking through against him. And in David's life and throughout this, he is constantly being delivered from his enemy. David also goes into detail about his um, peril and what he was up against. Right, Verses 5 and 6, For the waves of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. Death was coming. Destruction was coming. Sheol, the grave for the souls, was coming. We have the same problem. Though it it doesn't always come from, you know, warlords or soldiers and world leaders. But wherever it does come from, we all face death. Unless Jesus returns in our lifetime and takes us up, As we all know, we're all going to die at some point. What happens after that? Is it heaven? Or are you tangled in the cords of hell? We all were at one point. We've all sinned and earned that penalty. What did David do when he faced death and Sheol? Verse 7. In my distress... I called upon the Lord. To my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice. 
And my cry came to his ears. He called upon the Lord, and the Lord heard him. Now, when we think of the cords of hell that entangle so many people today, and how to become untangled, how to be saved from hell, Paul, the apostle, speaks some very similar words to this, actually, in chapter 10, verse 13 of his letter to the Romans, quoting the prophet Joel. He says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, there are some more specific things to be explained about that. right? You don't just call out anything to the Lord, and you don't just get saved by uh, saying the name of Jesus very loud. Right? A few verses earlier, actually, Paul gives a little more detail. Paul says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? Jesus needs to be Lord. You have to submit to his lordship while also believing in his resurrection. Putting your faith in him, how he died for your sins and how the Father raised him from the dead. But if that's something that you've trusted in, that you've placed your faith in, and you want to come to him for salvation, then calling on his name, you will be heard. He will save. And he will be to you a refuge that the enemy cannot snatch you from. John 10, 27, 29 says, My sheep, so those who believe are his sheep, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. There's no one who's going to snatch you from the Father's hand. There's no one who is even able to. He's got you. You're secure. But life on earth, of course, still isn't easy. And even if you found your salvation in him, which is eternal, there are still some times of distress before we get to heaven, where you can call, still call on his name, where you can still ask him for help or, or relief. We know that sometimes when that happens, when we call out, the bad stops, and sometimes, you know, it's something that he might bring us through and uh, that he'll give us strength to get through, even if... It's something that doesn't quite end until we've actually reached heaven. But he's always there to help you bear your burdens. He's always there for you to cast your cares upon. So don't be afraid to call on his name because we are weak. And we need him every hour. One of my favorite things, one of my favorite things that David says in this entire passage is, they were too mighty for me. At the end of verse 18, they were too mighty for me. My enemies were too mighty for me. Friends, we need God because our enemies, and namely Satan, he's too mighty for us. But he's not too mighty for our God. The way of escape is always there, for instance, in the midst of temptation. right? God always has a way for you to escape the invitation of the enemy. The devil made me do it is never a good excuse when you have a God trillions of times more powerful than the devil providing you with a way of escape. And also, when Satan tries to wear you down with, with different hardships and all these things, God has a stronger arm to lift you up. The devil can't tear down what God keeps up. The devil may be too mighty for you, but not for your God. Not for your God. What else? is too mighty for you. How about the law or trying to keep up those good works by your own strength? Don't get me wrong, we, we do have to work hard for the Lord. We can't just sit around and do nothing and expect, expect God's work just to be done. But at the same time, we need to rely on the Lord as we do our, our work for him, as we do our good works. Rely on him for, for energy, rely on him for wisdom, and of course, rely on him because if he's not at work, what good is actually getting done? I always say the most important thing for me about preaching is the prayer that goes into it. Because I could preach, you know, such a good sermon or whatever, most amazing sermon anyone's ever heard, but if God's not at work, if he's not working through it, 
then what's going to come out of it? Are people's hearts going to be changed? No, because God changes the heart. God's the one who works in hearts. So I want God to be so involved in both my writing and in my speaking. I still work hard, but I need to be relying on God. One thing, though, that we do need to understand about the law and about good works is that, again, they're not going to save us. They're too mighty for us in the sense that to achieve the level of works you need in order to be saved from hell and and allowed into heaven, you need to be 100% perfect, which is impossible, right? You're not saved by doing good. You're saved by the only real doer of good, Jesus Christ. He fulfilled that law perfectly when he was on the earth. And then he took the punishment of death that we deserved when he died on the cross. He took your place, right? He gets the wrath of God that you deserve. You get the eternal life that he deserves. It's not very fair. And that is if, again, if you place your faith in him and what he did for you, like we mentioned earlier. Not if you do a lot of great things and follow the law well, no. Salvation is not about what you've done. You're not mighty enough for that as a sinner. Salvation is about your faith in what Christ has done. It's about what Christ has done. Christ is the focus. Christ is the righteous one. Now, Christ also will still, of course, get that eternal life that he deserves as well. As we know, he rose again, and then he later ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. But even then, his work on the cross in taking the wrath of God upon himself, his sacrifice, that's still good for eternity, right? It's sufficient to cover all sins, past, present, and future. The offering of his life on the cross was the sin offering of all sin offerings. So you who believe, you're covered. You're covered by his cleansing blood. You're covered in his righteousness. The only righteousness good enough for entry into heaven, entry into eternal life, to be with him forever. I bring this up, this whole righteousness thing, Because it's interesting how David talks about his righteousness. Very, very different than maybe what we would expect. In verses 21 to 25, David says, The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept my guilt or I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. These are some very interesting words coming from David. Someone who was a sinner, right? Someone who wasn't perfect. Um, But what I think is, is from David's point of view, he's probably not actually speaking of himself as this completely sinless, perfect person. Rather, he likely speaks as one who hasn't turned his back on God, right? Even though he's fallen into sin and made very questionable calls, he's never abandoned his following the Lord. In application to these verses, Dale Ralph Davis says, Those who faithfully follow Yahweh and esteem his word by obeying it are those who can expect his blessing. Those who don't can't. Now, we still got to know that we won't follow him perfectly, right? But another thing that I want to take away from these verses is that maybe they were said prophetically. They, maybe there's some prophecy in here. There are things that David has said before that he's written in the Psalms, especially, that turned out to be prophetic. And one of the most popular instances is Psalm 22. And verses 16 to 18 say, For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. That's Jesus with the nails through his hands and his feet. I can count all my bones. Jesus' bones were not broken on the cross. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, 
they cast lots. The soldiers did that with Jesus' garment. It's as if Jesus is the one talking in this passage. But it's David's words that turn out to be prophetic. Maybe this is something that we're seeing that's similar here in 2 Samuel. I'm not sure, but uh, it would make sense because all these words, they line up with something that Jesus could say, right? The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. After Jesus' death, which was the opposite uh, of dealing with him according to his righteousness as he got what he did not deserve. After that, though, Jesus was rewarded according to his righteousness as he is in heaven now and he is um, beloved and glorified and all those things. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. Just imagine Jesus saying these things. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. This is something that Jesus could have said. And there is a sense, too, in which we can say something similar. Though I'd never say, you know, according to my righteousness, right? We want to be giving God the glory, right? This is what this sermon is about, giving God the glory. But, yeah, I wouldn't say it was according to my righteousness. It's according to Christ's righteousness. But according to Christ's righteousness, I want to say this, but according to Christ's righteousness, that's how the Lord deals with me. And that's how he will deal with you who believe. Not because of your works, right? Not because of any righteousness of your own, but instead because you've placed your faith in Christ and his work. He atoned for your sin. There was a substitutionary atonement, which means he took what you deserved so you could take what he deserved. So you are credited with his righteousness. So these things on here, it's almost like a statement about you because you have that righteousness now, even though it's not your own righteousness. Totally unfair. It's all totally unfair, but it is just. And it's something that we need to be thankful for, that God sees when he looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. At the end of all this, David concludes all of what he has said about God and all about what he has said about what God has done for him by saying this. For this, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king. David was king of God's people, Israel. He was God's king, not in the sense of being above God, but he was God's king in the sense of being chosen by God to lead his people. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. It's interesting because he's talking to God and he's talking to God a lot in the third person. And even when he's talking about himself at the end here, he says David instead of me. So it's interesting that way. But what he's doing is he's summing it all up. This is why I praise you, God. You bring me salvation. You show me steadfast love. And it's forever. It's forever. As followers of Jesus, God has brought us salvation. He has shown us steadfast love. And it's forever. That's why we should praise him. Our rock, our fortress, our refuge who keeps us from our enemy. That's why we should praise him. That's why we can give him thanks in everything that we do. And, and in every situation. Because this truth is always constant no matter what we're going through. We have salvation. We have God's love. And we have Jesus. And we have him forever. So when the bad comes, don't forget your refuge. Don't stop thanking him or, or giving him glory. And when the good comes, as I've learned recently even myself, don't forget, don't forget to thank him either then or to give him the glory then. 
Thank him even over the smallest blessings, like that, that barbecue. It was a small thing, but it was just a lot. Don't forget to thank him for the small blessings as well. And I get that it might not be easy, right? You'll need to work hard to remember him that often. Spend lots of time with him. That'll help set your minds on the things above. And you'll also need help to thank him in the bad times, right? Times where it's tough to glorify God when he's allowed, you know, these hard times to happen. But again, setting your mind on the things above, you know that this isn't your home. You know that, that there's something in store that, that's just so great that it's beyond being even imaginable. So great are the things of heaven that await us. And the fact that we get to be with Jesus forever. That's amazing. They're forever. Being with Christ is forever. So praise him in the good times and praise him even in those bad times. And if you need help with that, again, God is your help. God is your help. Rely on God. Bow with me in prayer. God, you are so good, and I'm so, I'm so thankful. And now that I'm thinking about it, especially, I, I'm so thankful for what you've done. But even when I don't think about it, even when we aren't thinking about it, bring things to mind so that we can thank you more. Help us to be more thankful. Help us to be more mindful that, you know, this creation, it's so beautiful, but that's you. That's your glory. That this little thing that happened, that's awesome. Let us thank you for it, even if it's just small. In everything, give Thanks. Help us with that, Lord, because you deserve it. You're so good. You've saved us from our enemy. You've saved us from Satan. You've saved us from our sin and its consequence of, of hell. You've saved us. You are our refuge. You are the one who keeps us from all those things. And you are powerful above them. You're so powerful. So we know, first off, you're faithful. You're going to keep your promise to us. Second of all, you're powerful. So they can't snatch us. It's just so amazing when we think of that. And so help us to think of those things. Help us to thank you for what you did. Help us to remember your love for us that, that, that took such, such form on the cross, Lord. There's, there's nothing really that shows us your love more than that, that image of, of Christ on the cross, what you did for us there. Just help us to think of all these things. Help us to remember these things. Help us to be thankful. And uh, yeah, because you deserve it. And uh, all the thanks in the world that we could give, all the glory that we could give you, all the honor, it still wouldn't be enough to give you what you deserve. So help us give it more. And uh, yeah, thank you again, God. You're so good. I pray this all in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen.